Hi, my name is Dale Maley. Today we're going to talk about a very interesting project with peg gears and bevel gears, all made from wood. Wood. A little bit of history. Back in 2014, I wanted to build a hand cranked wood model that had both grist mill peg gears and bevel gears. I also want to be able to hand crank the gears in both directions. In other words, if I crank the peg gears, they drive the bevel gears, and vice versa. If I crank the bevel gears, they drive the peg gears. At the time, I thought designing and making the peg gears was a no-brainer. I thought the real challenge was designing and making bevel gears in wood. So for the peg gears, I went into SketchUp, free drafting program, and I designed some simple peg gears that had five teeth on the small gear, 10 teeth on the big gear, and then I wanted to use quarter inch dowels for the pegs. So let's just take a chance to step back in time and see how the peg gears were used. They're primarily used in grist mills which were used to grind up grain into flour. And they were used on grist mills clear back to the Roman times until the late 1800s and when the Industrial Revolution happened we started to have metal bevel gears instead. And why were these so popular for almost 1,800 years? Because they're so much easier to make peg gears <coughs> than today's steel bevel gears. And here's a typical diagram showing a water wheel that's eventually running some grinding stones to grind grain up into flour. Now here's a photograph of that model I made back in 2010. And you'll see that I have two sets of cranks over there so you can drive it either direction. So when I tried it out, if I crank the bottom crank, which actually runs the uh, peg gears first, which in turn drive the bevel gears, everything worked fine. It ran in both directions too. However, when I went up to the top bevel gear of that crank and I tried to crank it, the bevel gears would work, but the peg gears bound up. And it didn't matter if I turned them clockwise or counterclockwise on the crank. Either way, the peg gears bound up on the bottom and I could not figure out why. So back in the 2014 era, I was still working full time as an engineer. I had not retired yet. So my spare time for doing woodwork, woodworking projects was pretty limited. So at this point, back in 2010, <clears throat> I gave up and removed the top crank on the bevel gears and just left a model that had one crank on it. But for years afterwards, it's always bugged me. Why didn't that model work? So back 10 years ago, I finally just gave up and I sawed off the crank that I had on the top bevel gears. And I finished the model with just one crank on the bottom that would drive the peg gears, which in turn drove the uh, wood bevel gears. So this month in September of 2024, I did a Google search on how to design uh, grist mill gears or peg gears. And I found a website where an unknown author developed the mathematics that are involved with designing peg gears. And it's two pages on the website. Uh, the first page uh, develops the mathematics. The second page, he converts the mathematics over to an online design calculator. And here's the web address of that uh, document with developing the math and the online calculator. Now this is probably too small a print to read, but this is just a portion of that first page where he's developing the math that goes behind properly designing peg gears. Now here's a screenshot of the online calculator. <clears throat> Don't worry about uh, reading the text here because we're going to describe the inputs that you make and the outputs that you make in just a second. So there are really only three inputs you have to make into the calculator. The first would be the peg diameter, the second would be the number of pegs in the vertical wheel, and the third would be the number of pegs in the horizontal wheel. The fourth input is tangential play. You can change that, but he suggests using 3% of the peg diameter. And the fifth one is the peg length, which is also variable, but he suggests using 55% of the peg diameter. So you plug, uh, really you're just plugging in three inputs into the calculator. Now technically there's three outputs from the calculator, but really you just use two. 
The first one would be what your pitch diameter is going to be on the vertical wheel, and then the second one is your pitch diameter on the horizontal wheel. It also outputs the minimum distance between pegs, and don't I didn't really use that factor. Okay, I made a little mistake here. My next step, my next step in the process, I inputted, it should say my 2014 bad design, not my 2010 bad design, but from 10 years ago. I went ahead and put my uh, inputs in from my bad design that would not work. And that had five pegs on the vertical wheel, ten pegs on the horizontal wheel, and a quarter inch peg diameter. And holy cow, it broke the calculator. So that's probably a good thing because that means uh, the calculator predicts my design would not work. And in fact, it did not work. It would bind up. So I used the online calculator to come up with a design that should work. And after playing around with a calculator, I came up with 10 pegs on the vertical wheel, 20 pegs on the horizontal wheel with quarter inch diameter pegs. And once it told me what the pitch diameters of the gears were, I laid that out in SketchUp. But I noticed in SketchUp there's no allowance for normal woodworking tolerances. You can't uh, build wood models uh, perfect. So I decided maybe I could trick the calculator. And when I use a calculator, I would say, no, I'm not using quarter inch pegs. I'm using a little bit bigger, like a quarter inch plus a 32nd. I put that in the calculator, get the outputs for the pitch diameters, and then I laid that. Uh, but when I went to build the model, I plan on still using the quarter inch diameter pegs. So I laid that out in SketchUp, and I did have a little bit of tolerance. It looked okay. So here's what my design looked like in SketchUp. You can see the two peg gears down on the bottom crank. Initially, I did not have a shaft extending down from the bottom of the vertical gear down into the base. But when I build up the model, it wouldn't work because the pegs on the horizontal wheel, as they tried to engage the smaller gear, they push that smaller gear away from it to the left. So I went ahead and added a second shaft coming down. Then I added a little bearing block there to keep it in the right position. And I screwed that into location with screws coming up from the bottom. Once I, an I uh, added that bottom shaft with a support, then the model worked okay. So when I was ready to actual, actually make the uh, peg gears, I printed out the paper patterns for them from SketchUp. And I needed those to make the top and bottom round pieces of the vertical gear, which uh, give you the location to drill the quarter inch holes. I also used a paper pattern on the horizontal gear, which tells you where to drill those uh, 20 holes. I don't really have any pictures of doing the drilling and, and then pressing the pins in the two ends. It's pretty normal woodworking processes. However, when I got it done and I put the model together and I added that lower shaft on there to keep the vertical gear in alignment, it really worked great. So now that I had the peg gears built, the last half of the project is to make the bevel gears. Now I knew that I wanted uh, three and a half inch uh, outside diameters on the gears. They'd both be the same size. And then I wanted 14 teeth in each gear. Which means, uh, and then also my gear blank then, I wanted to shoot for about two inches high. Where the upper one inch would be the uh, gear teeth. And of course you have to have a 45 degree taper on that top one inch because they are bevel gears. So to make these bevel gears I decided to use a similar method that I used to make wooden worm gears. So what that means is I want to end up with a paper pattern that I can wrap around the outside diameter of the gear blank at the bottom of the taper. I glue that on temporarily to the blank and then mark the tops of the teeth. Then I'll take a piece of string and I'll run that from the lower tooth mark up to the center line of the gear on the top. I'll hold that string in place with one hand and take the other hand, take a pencil, and then draw uh, the edges of the teeth on both sides of the string. 
Then what I have to do is remove all that material between the tops of the teeth with a Dremel and a round file. Now if the circumference of the circle is uh, pi times the diameter, then for a three and a half inch OD gear, do the math and the circumference comes out at 10.995 inches, which is essentially 11 inches. So from SketchUp, this drawing shows how I came up with that paper pattern. So I know that my uh, piece of paper has to be 11 inches long. Um, I wanted the teeth to be about a half an inch thick or deep. On the tops of the teeth, uh, they're actually going to get smaller as you go from the outside bottom of the teeth up to the top. They're going to get a little bit smaller because of the 45 degree angle. So I'll start out at the bottom with the teeth having a width of around 3 sixteenths of an inch. And then uh, if you do the math, it works out then uh, the distance between teeth comes out to be uh, 25, 30 seconds. And how did I get that? Well, if you take 14 teeth and divide it by 11 inch length, you come out with uh, 0.7857, shown, the mass shown at the bottom, which is about 25, 30 seconds. And this means then I'm going to have to remove just over half an inch, 19, 30 seconds. So a half inch uh, round file should fit in there and work pretty good for helping to remove that excess material. Here's a photograph of my first gear blank glued up so I'm using three pieces of three quarter inch thick red oak I sawed those four inch long I want a little bit of extra so I come out with a three and a half inch diameter circle and that means my gear blank uh, thickness or height is going to be three times that three quarter inch which is going to be two and a quarter now that's just a smidgen over the two inch target height I wanted but it should be fine so here are the steps I used to change that rectangular blank into uh, a round gear blank that's at three and a half inch diameter. So I used my chop miter saw to remove the edges of the rectangular blank and then I took a compass and I marked out a four inch outside diameter. I wanted a little bit extra above the three and a half inch to give me some stock on the lathe. I took the blank over to my uh, drill press where I have a three inch diameter drum sander which is 60 grit very aggressive and that'll quickly take that down to a, uh, about a four inch diameter blank for the lathe. I checked that up in the lathe using a three jaw chuck. I qualified one end or turned one end down to be three and a half inch target diameter. Then I need it to be exactly three and a half inches so I can put the paper pattern on and the two inches uh, exactly touch. So I used that paper pattern as kind of a gauge to tell me when I had the outside diameter exactly right at three and a half inches. Then I could flip the blank in for end in the lathe and then make the other end also three and a half inches diameter. Now here's a photo and at this step of the process I have the one the first end turned down to the three and three and a half inches diameter that I want. So here I flipped it in for end and put it into the lathe chuck as you can see here that a right hand diameter is still around four inches so my next step is turn that right hand side down so it's also exactly three and a half inches. So while I had the gear blank in the lathe it's also a good time you can use the lathe as a drill press and I, I bored the three quarter inch hole on the lathe that you need to later fit it to the three quarter inch dial shaft. And here's a photo showing where I turn the uh, 45 degree bevel gear angle on the lathe. So this photograph shows where I've glued the paper pattern uh, around the bottom of the blank, as you can see, with white Elmer's glue. I, one hand I held a string from the center of, the, uh, of each tooth up to the very center of the gear on top. Then I marked the tops of the teeth with a pencil on both sides of the string. So to remove that excess material between the gear te teeth, I used a combination. I used a half inch round file as shown here. I also used my Dremel with a uh, kind of a deburr attachment on it to also remove material between the teeth. And uh, it's kind of a boring process, but that's how you make the, the teeth. And I end up with 14 teeth per gear. 
In this photograph it shows the first gear, bevel gear, uh, it's basically completed and all that's left is the remains of the white paper pattern so I took a wet rag and I simply scrubbed off the excess uh, white paper then I sanded uh, as best I could the whole gear in my drill press using a 220 grit spindle sander. So I wanted to make uh, this wood model colorful so I used some water-based dye powder and as you can see here this is cardinal red it comes in a powder form you mix that with water and usually you got to put about two coats on to get a nice color using the water dye. And for uh, some of the other parts I use a cherry stain for example on the two red oak bevel gears. So on these uniquely designed uh, wood models you always run into a few problems and uh, I ran into a problem here when I was assembling the uh, peg gears to the base I made some bearings to hold the three quarter inch shafts. What I did, I clamped the bearings temporarily in place with C-clamps so the clearances were good and the gears run good. Then I screwed in from the back of the base to hold the bearings in place. That worked great on the peg gears. I tried the same thing on the bevel gears and it just did not work. I'd get them clamped up where they worked and screw them in and they wouldn't work. So I ended up making uh, the bearing base is adjustable and you'll see how I did that in a second I just uh, used an extra wood block to do it. So here's my drawing in SketchUp and you can see the back of the model where I added the adjustable piece. So I drilled uh, two half inch holes in the vertical base unit to let me move the bearing around Then I ran the screws in from that block into the bearing block what that does it lets me move it around until it works good and then screw it into place. Now before we watch the finished model run which is the fun part I thought I'd make a quick summary gear and kind of compare my uh, two designs. My first design up there had uh, quarter inch pegs, uh, five pegs in the small gear, ten in the large. It could be driven uh, in both directions by the large gear but it could not be uh, driven in both directions by the small gear. And how did I design that? I just did a quick and uh, dirty design using SketchUp. When I used the website calculator I came up with twice as many pegs basically. I had 10 in the small gear and 20 in the large gear. And as you'll see in a second uh, works uh, both directions. So the moral of the story is use the website calculator to design your peg gears. Whenever you do a unique project like this, I always have some lessons learned. The first big lesson I was learned was you really need to use a mathematical approach when you design peg gears versus trying just to wing it like I did. Second major thing I learned was you need to allow a little tolerance in your model and I accomplished that by tricking the online calculator. I told the calculator I was using a slightly bigger dowel but in reality I was still going to build with a quarter inch dowel. So in summary, this video explains how to design and build both peg gears and bevel gears. Hopefully this video helps you with your projects. I hope you enjoyed the video and please subscribe. Thank you.